thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Beth. I'm the adult services librarian here at the library. I um, just wanted to let you know that we have our summer reading club going on. If you haven't already signed up, go down to the information desk under the question mark and just give us your name and library card number. And every time you read a book or attend a program, um, you get an entry into our prize drawings. You can win a Kindle Voyage. Um, we also have programs books that if you'd like to grab one on your way out, and they have all of our programs for the summer. And uh, I have a sign-in sheet if you want to put your name and library card number. If you'll get credit for the summer reading club and then we'll pay our prize drawings. So today uh, we have Clarence Dub Sudicum, who's going to tell us about a Missouri governor during the Civil War named Claiborne Fox Jackson. Thank you, Beth. First of all, thanks. Uh, to the library folks for allowing me to come and uh, talk about some person that uh, within the state of Missouri during, I'll say, the early portion of the Civil War has been grace, well, left to history. Uh, not many people knew that uh, Mr. Jackson was the governor, uh, possibly because of the short-lived uh, term that he served, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, as you can see, my name tag, uh, it says the Civil War Roundtable. This is going to be a paid political announcement now. Uh, there's an organization in Cape Girardeau called the Civil War Roundtable of Cape Girardeau or the Cape Girardeau Civil War Roundtable, which meets on the third Sunday of every month out at Hanover Lutheran Church at 2 p.m. and we the programs are entirely devoted to Civil War related topics and we have had uh, just this past weekend the program that was presented here at the public library by Joanne and Rebecca on the ladies fashions during the Civil War which was very very interesting. Uh, we have had other presenters. Uh, we had the superintendent of Wilson's Creek Battlefield come and give us a program a couple of years ago. Uh, fortunately, his daughter at that time was teaching in the Jackson School uh, System and he made it a point to uh, come over and speak with us over the third Sunday again. We've had people who have authored books uh, about the Civil War and so forth come and, and speak with us. And the topics have been varied. Uh, for instance, if you look uh, possibly at uh, a photograph of, of a Civil War soldier uh, who's had his picture taken by a professional photographer, I want you to look real close and check and see which side of his coat the part is buttoned over, where the buttons are, left side or right side. In many photographs that were taken during that time, the right side was erroneously shown in the photograph because of the photography's methods during that period of time. When they brought out the, the photograph, it was reversed when it was printed in uh, newspapers or other types of manuscripts. Another thing, if it's a full-length photograph, look real close and usually right above the ears you may see what look like maybe hair out of place. Uh, because of the duration of the photographic process, these people had to stand very, very rigid or the photograph would be blurred. So they had a stand behind them which held them erect with a kind of a, a horseshoe that held their head steady so that they wouldn't move and blur the photograph. If it's a full length and you can see the floor, a lot of times you can see the, the center post of the stand behind. So just a couple of incidentals, uh, and I didn't know that until we had a program uh, by a gentleman out of Southern Illinois who was interested in Civil War photography that uh, came forward. So we have a varied uh, group uh, of people who come and, and talk with us, and they're all very, very interesting. So, once again, uh, the third Sunday of every month at Hanover Lutheran Church on Perryville Road at 2 p.m. Uh, our next program uh, 
It will, of course, be in July, and then we have decided and voted to take a field trip to the Missouri Civil War Museum at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, in August, so in lieu of our regular meeting. Okay, enough uh, public announcements here. Claiborne Fox Jocks, Jackson, his life and his times, what we'll be t talking about today is the family background, uh, his lineage. We're going to get into a little history formative early life and we're going to talk about Missouri history. We will incorporate a little geography into this so that uh, you get an idea of uh, where he came from, what uh, formulated his thoughts and uh, probably gave interest to his later political career. We'll look at his political life, the early influences on Jackson uh, and also take a look possibly at uh, what we considered his ambitions. Uh, prior to and uh, during the early Civil War period. There are going to be some national and state issues that uh, caused him to act uh, in the way he did. His pro-Southern stance will become apparent. Uh, some of the national issues we're going to hear about will be the hard currency versus soft currency issue, which uh, had an influence on his decision. Also, the Texas issue of 1844, and we'll be also bringing into effect uh, on the national scheme the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Redistricting is another act that occurred internally within the state of Missouri in the 1842s, and this affected uh, the political life of Jackson. We'll take a brief look at that, and we'll take a look at his travels and the military issues uh, that ensued. We'll also be exposed to some of his political and legislative maneuverings as he sought to keep Missouri or join the Southern Confederacy. Here's some brief highlights uh, for you to consider. He was born in 1806 in the Piedmont area of Virginia. Now the Piedmont area of Virginia is this area basically along the Chesapeake Channel, which comes inland a little bit before you have a gentle rise, in, uh, I mean the Tidewater area, before you have a gentle rise till you get into the Piedmont area, which is just a little bit more inland. And then of course you run into the mountains uh, in uh, Western Virginia and of course uh, West Virginia. So born in 1806 in the Piedmont area, he had 10 siblings. His early uh, life through the 20s uh, was spent uh, basically in the, what we found out and called the Boone's Lick Trace area of Missouri, which was an old Indian trail which started in St. Louis, followed the Missouri River, of course, through Jefferson, up here into these about four counties where it goes up from uh, and then winds over to Kansas City. So this is the area that we'll be considering in, in Jackson's early life. And like I said, it follows an old Indian trail, and Daniel Boone traveled that and uh, had a salt lake up in this area somewhere in, during his history. So it's called the Boone's Lake Trace, just this kind of small segment, but it followed the old Indian trail all the way up into Kansas City. <laughs> he became a Democratic Party chief he was with the Democratic uh, affiliations and a Missouri state representative. And he was elected governor in 1860, the same year as who? Mr. Lincoln was elected president. Jackson was also a minority elected governor. He was evicted, and I use that term uh, from the content of how he had to leave the state by union authorities and he dies in Arkansas on December the 7th, 1862. 1862, the war doesn't end until 1865. Now, are there any questions? Okay, having none, ma'am? Well, he was born in 1806 and died in 1862. So, here we go. Let's get into the family background. Uh, we're not going to leave you hanging after you've paid so much money to come and enjoy this uh, afternoon. Uh, 
the family can trace its lineage uh, back to Piedmont area, which I pointed out in Virginia, all the way back to 1724. So uh, they moved to Kentucky in uh, 1792, so about 68 years later, after living in the Piedmont area of Virginia, they moved to Kentucky. And in April the 4th of 1806, Claiborne Fox Jackson was born. April the 4th, 1806. 20 years uh, later, so he was now about 20 years, maybe 21 years old, the family moved uh, into this area here, which we call the Boone's Lick Trace. They came over, of course, from Kentucky. They probably came up down the Ohio, up the Mississippi, uh, and then hit the Missouri and came over into, and that's why this map is on this side of these two blue lines, which represent the Mississippi River. So now we go west of the river. That was funny, my uh, my uncle up in South Dakota, when when I would go up pheasant hunting a couple of years uh, after I got out of college, he would always say, we're going west of the river, we're up west of the river, the Mississippi River, what he interned at that time to, to hunt. But anyway, so they ended up uh, in Franklin County, right here in the town of Franklin, uh, which was in Howard County. And at that period of time, in about 1826, 24, 25, 26, Franklin County was probably the state's fastest growing area because it was called Missouri's Boomtown. In 1827, it was credited to being the third largest town in the state of Missouri behind St. Louis and a place right up the river from us, St. Genevieve. So you had St. Louis up there, you had St. Genevieve, and then you had Franklin, Missouri. Uh, there was a family there which uh, his last name was Sappington. The gentleman was a doctor, Dr. John Sappington, and it was the most prominent family with wealth and everything in this, in this trace area, just this little four county trace area. And we'll see why. The, very, very strong uh, and profitable agricultural area. Uh, they raised commercially tobacco, hemp, and cotton. And all of these three crops indicate the need for what at that time? Manual labor, manual labor. So it was necessary for the owners of the properties there to have sufficient manual labor and it ended up being in the form of slaves to come and take care of the agriculture requirements. Approximately 30 to 35 percent of that trace area was slave population during that time, the 20s and 30s and so forth, where the rest of the uh, state had less than uh, 10 percent. So three, three times as many slaves lived in that little area uh, of the Boone's Lick Trace uh, as throughout the rest of the state. Now, in 1784, Congress passed an ordinance which we call the Northwest Ordinance, which, and this is a little tricky, forbade slavery in all territories and states carved from the West, the West at that time being Everything Jefferson considered when he drafted this west of the Mississippi River. 1784 Northwest Ordinance prohibited slavery in all territory and or states formed west of the river. Ah. Now, the early Confederate Congress, and I'll call Confederation Congress because the South in many cases controlled uh, the federal government at that time with the number of representatives and senators, they interpreted west of the river meaning just the area lying north of the Ohio River, which comes in at where, Kiro? Just north of the Ohio River and east of the Mississippi. So north of the Ohio River and east of the Mississippi brings us back on this side over here again. Which eliminates which state? Missouri. So this is what the Southerners say. Okay, you're not talking about any area 
west of the river, you're talking about east of the river. So Missouri, from their standpoint, was not considered to be slave-free territory and or states in the future. Jackson uh, time decides uh, they've been uh, in Franklin for a while that uh, he doesn't particularly care for the farming you know that's probably pretty tough work and he wants to become a merchant. Now I'll digress a little bit and talk about a little bit of my personal family history. My grandfather was born on a farm out uh, a little southeast of Gordonville and uh, a little bit north uh, northeast of Dutchtown and uh, he, he kind of migrated to Cape in the same way and had the same kind of uh, feelings that Jackson did. He told my father, it relates to me, the story that Grandpa told him. He said he, he didn't want to break his back planting and picking and uh, digging potatoes the rest of his life. So he comes to Cape Girardeau and, and finds a job with uh, a lumber company and everything and, and ends up uh, owning his own business. So I, uh, I had, hate to rate my grandfather to Claiborne Fox Jackson, because my grandfather was a staunch Republican and, and Jackson was a staunch Democrat, but uh, they had similar priorities in their lives. Uh, in 1826, probably right after they've gotten there, uh, Jackson clerks in a prominent trading company in the Trace area. So he finds employment in a trading company. And a year later, he becomes the firm's debt collector, which means that, hey, He's basically chief financial officer for this trading company now. So he's going to be in, in charge of the finances and collect the debt. He also becomes a member of the uh, Howard County Militia against the uh, Osage and the Delaware and the Shawnees who raid into that area. And in the late 1820s, early 1830s, we have a phenomena that creates a need for goods down in the southwest. Uh, the tribes have been relocated and everything. They're pretty well pacified. So now you have a trail, which we now know and was called at that time the Santa Fe Trail, which became safer for these wagon trains that were carrying goods into the southwest area. Uh, since they were safer, they didn't have to worry quite as much about the Indians raiding and so forth and the profits, uh, of course, went up when this was realized. So, Santa Fe Trail started in Independence, Missouri. It's got the green, little green punch pin here. Traveled out west, I think, to uh, west of Salina, dropped down to the Arkansas River, follows it all the way over to Bent's Fort, then comes down and ends up through Rayton Pass in Colorado and then ends up in Santa Fe. And of course, right below that's Albuquerque. So this is a trade route. Now there's an alternate route which cut off a little bit here, but it went through some mountains and was not very profitable because the weathers uh, took care of it. But this was a trade route that uh, Jackson saw an interest in in becoming a merchant and a very, very profitable merchant. Uh, he wants to open and operate his own business. He didn't want to work for somebody else because the owners are going to be the ones that are going to be, I'll say, skimming off the profits. Jackson's not going to get much being uh, a, an employee of that particular company. So in 1828, he applies for and is granted a one-year operating permit uh, in Howard County and operates his own business as a, a trader of goods going into the Southwest, and it's renewed again a year later in 1829. Now, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Claiborne's personal life. Remember I mentioned a doctor by the name of John Sappington who was at the top of the society in the wealth in the uh, Trace area. He developed and he got that way because he developed a prescription pill for an ailment which we call ague back then. A-G-U-E. Which was just a fever. Kind of like uh, aspirins now I guess you'd say. And he parlayed that into a marketing uh, element throughout the entire Midwest and west of the Appalachian Mountains. So he became very, very wealthy by developing this cure for ague. Sappington has a large family. Claiborne Fox Jackson looks at this and he says, if I'm going to get anywhere in society in this area, I need to try to associate myself with the Sappingtons. So, 
Consequently, he courts Jane Sappington, one of Dr. John's daughters, and they are married in February of 1831. So now he's got a connection to the most highly respected, wealthy person in the trade. Unfortunately, Jane does not live too long. She passes in the 21st of July. So about four months, she's gone. So here is Claiborne without his connection to the family. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. John has a large family of daughters and sons. And another daughter, Louisa Catherine, is available. So a couple years later, in September of, 80, of 33, Jackson marries her. So now we're back, the connection is established again with the family. A couple years later, due to Jackson's financial management experience, Dr. John makes him a partner, seven-way partner, with the sons and, and uh, sons-in-laws in his business. And he, he is made the comptroller in Sappington's business, which puts him right probably under Dr. John because he is now in control of the finance and, and oversees the financial responsibilities of Sappington's businesses. And he sold his mercantile partnerships then that he had established, remember the uh, licensing and so forth, he sold those uh, in 36 and 37. Now, talk about the prominent political parties at the time in the state of Missouri. Sappington uh, supported uh, Thomas Hart Benton, who was a very, very prominent uh, senator within the state of Missouri who was a proponent of the Jacksonian democratic philosophy. Andrew Jackson, Jacksonian political philosophy. Against tariffs, against protective tariffs. Jackson didn't want to protect any tariffs. He didn't like national banks. He didn't like a national system of internal improvements, bridges, roads, or anything. And most of all, he hated the Electoral College. Reason being, he was a defender of the individual person's rights. Internal tariffs uh, protected only the business interests. Electoral College was not one person, one vote representative, and we all know that to this day. It's carried on the same way. Now, this was fine for the agriculturists in the trace, but you had the merchant class of people which decided, uh, this was not helping them at all, and they favored a fellow by the name of Henry Clay, who was very, very important in the Missouri Compromise legislation, which called his philosophy the American system. Positively for high tariffs, protect, protect your own people, protect your merchants, a national banking system so that you could trade dollars for dollars anywhere in the United States of equal value. And he also was a proponent of national improvements and needed roads because the country was expanding westward, whether the people south of the Ohio River wanted to or not. He could see and foresee the need to build roads and eventually railroads into the west. Now it's time for Claiborne to make a decision. He's in a dilemma. Which political path does he choose to follow? What philosophy is he going to espouse? Uh, Benton's philosophy, of course, which aided the agriculturists in the state, or uh, Clay's American system, which favored the merchants. Initially, he selects Benton's because the agricultural business is the most important at that time. He can see that. Now, because of this, he's appointed the first postmaster in Arrow Rock, which is another small town uh, in the Trace, um, approximately area, Arrow Rock, uh, Missouri, for an annual salary of 50 bucks a year. So it's a pretty important job. Uh, he announces in 1836 as Democratic candidate for Missouri House of Representatives, and he's an underdog. He's unknown throughout the state. Now, in the 1830s, 1840s, state representatives were elected statewide. Not like it is today. This is before we had districting. And uh, 
he wins by six votes statewide. Now, interesting little sideline is he carries the Arrow Rock District 47 to 1. You know, being the postmaster, I'm sure you, you exert a little influence. So he, there's some dissatisfied customer throughout that district, uh, but Arrow Rock puts him over by uh, six votes. During this time, we're having issues within the National Democratic Party, and it is beginning to splinter. You have the Jacksonian Democrats versus the Clay American System Democrats, and they split philosophy-wise, and the emergence of a, another political group. Anyone have an idea of what group that is or what it was called? Okay. The Whigs. The Whigs start to come out and they call themselves uh, Whigs. Uh, in Missouri at that time you had the rural agrarian outstate uh, politicians versus the St. Louis area industrialists. St. Louis at this time was taking on an industrial uh, complex and, and doing very, very well. Now, in this election, Jackson supported the Boone's Lick uh, area conservative issues, and uh, in 1836, President Andrew Johnson does not renew the National Banking Charter, which they had earlier. So now, you know, here we come, the Jacksonian business is, uh, philosophy is taking over. And you have an emergence of a lot of private banks, like we had it in, in Cape Girardeau in the state of Missouri, you know, a few years ago. Uh, you had six or seven or eight different little banks uh, pop out uh, the ground uh, here in Cape Girardeau in, in the near area. So they start issuing their own currency, but they don't have the backing. It's not backed by gold or silver or any, anything. So devaluation occurs throughout the state. You have banks in St. Louis issuing money. You have banks in uh, St. Genevieve issuing money and Franklin issuing money, and there's no backing. So tremendous uh, devaluation occurs. Uh, the Bank of Missouri was one bank that was established uh, in Fayette in one side, and because of Jackson's political prominence, he's uh, named the first cashier or manager uh, of that bank in Howard County. Now, he, he's kind of stunned a little bit, so he stays out of politics for five years. Five years. He uh, partners in a successful trading company, and that's, that's where we're moving toward. Uh, he buys and he sells property. He gets into the real estate business. He purchases racehorses, and he buys more slaves for his property. And all of this gives an indication and perception that, hey, he is climbing the social ladder very, very quickly, and uh, possibly is someone to be reckoned with. Uh-oh, Louisa Catherine, his second wife, passes away in 1838. Uh-oh, another sad happening. Here again, Jackson realizes that he needs to stay connected with the Sappington family for his future successes. Fortunately, one of the other Sappington daughters, who has married, is widowed. And guess what happens? Claiborne decides that's his entree back into the family. So in 1838, he marries Eliza. And this is really convenient for both, both sides, the Sappington family and uh, uh, due to Jackson's financial management within the organization, the family business, and also for Jackson because now it reestablishes this connection again. He's reelected the House of Representatives in 42, and he's voted the majority floor leader and parliamentarian under the Speaker of the House at that time, a fellow by the name of Sterling Price, whose name is prominent in Missouri Civil War actions, and he's only 36 years of age. Now, you see festering within the politics of Missouri, the, I'll say, Boone's Lick agroecology, uh, agroeconomy and slavery versus the St. Louis industrialization. You have Northeastern people 
people in the Northeast way, way above here, talking about how slavery in slave societies, they're stagnant. Uh, they, you know, they don't advance very fast. They're humanly degrading. They're reactionary, and, and they're inefficient, basically, as far as economics are concerned. They talk about, hey, free labor now is dignified, it's industrious, it's egalitarian, and it is progressive. So we have conflicting political issues in Missouri at the time, and Jackson just can't quite get away from his early times. He, th he seeks to legitimize the culture that he was raised in. And he thought he understood, he's, while opposing the expansion of a nation, he didn't understand. So he's very, very short-sighted. Although he wants to trade with the Southwest, he, doesn't, he can't foresee the movement of the country westward. So he's going to tr try to control everything in this area here in the state of Missouri. Nothing westward, nothing Kansas, Colorado, or anything that's happening out in California. Remember I mentioned the hard versus soft currency issue, which uh, became a, an issue back in uh, the 18, uh, late 1830s. In 1842, back, he's back in the House of Representatives, and uh, he's fighting this issue. Now, he loses his first battle uh, against the hard currency thing, but uh, he wins it in 1843. A year later, he brings the issue up again, and he's successful, and they pass it. So by virtue of his leadership in the House, here he's gaining more recognition and political power. Then you have the redistricting issue in Missouri. And in 1842, because of the political clout in this area right up in here, Jackson fights against redistricting because right now, presently, that area basically controls the legislature in the House, of, in the, in the House and the Senate in Missouri. But uh, he delays it until 1844, and in 1844, they pass a redistricting issue. Redistricting issue now, it's a funny thing. As I mentioned earlier, the representatives in Missouri at that time are elected at large. Okay? But how are the senators elected? Ah. Oh. The representatives elect the state senators. So if you control the House, you control the Senate. Jackson realized. So that is why that uh, redistricting issue became very, very important in Jackson's political uh, economy. In 1844, you had uh, the issue of the Texas annexation from Mexico, and uh, this really split the Democratic Party in, in Missouri. The click, uh, Boone's click, uh, click, and the rest of the state Democrats, uh, of course, uh, were really hurt by this. In April of 1844, President Tyler signed a treaty annexing Texas from Mexico. What gives him the authority to do that? Now, it leads to the perception of many people that, hey, because now Texas is being carved out of Mexico, that this is basically a legal expansion of slavery into Texas and the Southwest. Kind of an executive order type thing now. Now slavery can, can move into the Southwest and those other states and territories. Benton, Senator Thomas Benton, renounces the treaty as uh, Extension is what he calls of legal slavery in the new area. And Claiborne actually openly and publicly opposes Jack or Benson's stance. Now you have the Whig Party, as I mentioned earlier, emerging and becoming into little prominence, and they their press reports that Jackson will not support Benton in the next election. But but he does. But he does. Most Missourians uh, during this time period considered themselves as Westerners with no political affiliation to either North or South, and the right of slavery's extension into new territories or states shouldn't be restricted. In other words, people should be free to choose. This was the 
concept of most of the citizens of Missouri. Now, the folks up in the uh, Boone's Lake Trace uh, said, no, no, they figured they were pro-slavery for everything. You know, it had to be pro-slavery or nothing in their, in their estimation. So this was the Texas issue that uh, caused a, more of a split in the Democratic Party in Missouri. Jackson's re-elected to the House in 1844, and he's elected Speaker. Benton verbally now opposes the war with Mexico, which took place in 1846-1847. He supports it legislatively, but uh, he also supported, back in 1842, an amendment which came known as the Wilmot Proviso. Maybe you've heard that term. Which uh, Mr. Wilmot tried to attach to the Texas bill which would prohibit slavery in any territory gained from Mexico. Now, Jackson didn't like this, and he challenged the legality of the Missouri Compromise, which, remember, put a bottom at the base of the, the uh, boundaries of our present state down in the boot hill. Everything north of that would be free to choose. Everything south could, could uh, become slave states. Now, he stirred the anti-Benton uh, anti pot again by uh, saying the Missouri Compromise was uh, illegal in its effect. And as Speaker of the House, he and John Napton, another representative, drafted the State of Missouri Resolutions. Number one, the U.S. Congress has no right to legislate against slavery in any of the territories. Number two, encourage popular sovereignty in the territories to equalize the union of the states. And both Jackson and Napton believe that because slavery is in all right in the state of Missouri, that it will move gradually westward into Kansas and Colorado and everything. And he won't be limited and people will not then be uh, prone to vote for popular sovereignty or freedom or choice. It'll take its normal course. And the third item was, this is, this is the real killer. You release Missouri from the Missouri Compromise for the sake of harmony and the preservation of the Union. So what we're saying now is, down here, Missouri is no longer a recipient of the restrictions that the Missouri Compromise stated. So, also, what he does now as Speaker, he and Napton send a letter to the Congress and says, if the U.S. Congress passes any of those acts that are contrary to the will of the Missourians, Missouri is going to cooperate with the slaveholding states. And they instruct, or I use the term demand, Missouri senators to conform to those three restrictions above. And also, of course, Benton opposes those resolutions and loses in 18, the 1848 election. Johnson's re -elected, or Jackson's re-elected the House in 1852, but he loses in 1854. As I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of Missourians, they wanted neither alliance with North or South, but they wanted to become a part of the separate Middle West uh, with no alliances. Another contentious issue which really caused consternation in the political makeup of the state was the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act, where the Kansas should come in as a slave state because Nebraska came in as a free state. Now, the final act, Final form was uh, set up by Stephen Douglas, who proposed the philosophy of popular sovereignty. Uh, you know, let the territories uh, choose their right. Let the, and when they became states, they could choose their their right whether they wanted to be free or, or uh, slave. Here again, Missouri's citizens thought they would settle the Kansas issue because uh, you know that was a normal expansion westward. But the northeasterners through the immigrants' uh, aid societies began flooding the Kansas territory with settlers and upsetting the southern-leaning Missourians. 
So now the state of Missouri is very, very ripe for a strong pro-independent leadership. After losing the election in 54, Jackson Farms acquires more land and more wealth and during the next few years, and he acquires up to 47 slaves, and he inherits and or purchases Dr. Sappington's farm estate. So with third Sappington daughter at his side, uh, uh, he's able to probably muscle in a little bit because of his position as chief financial officer of the businesses, uh, enough uh, leverage to buy the Sappington properties. He's defeated in 1856 for the Missouri House of Representatives again, but he's appointed uh, the first state bank commissioner in the state of Missouri for an annual salary of $5,000. Big paying job. Pro-slavery politicians gained control of the Missouri Congress in the mid-58 elections, and Jackson's nominated for governor in April of, 19, of 1860. He's elected governor with about 47% of the vote, a little higher uh, plurality than Lincoln got in the state of Missouri. And uh, elections are held in November, like they are now, Inaugurations of political peoples back then did not take place until March. So you had basically Governor Stewart, Robert Stewart, as a lame duck governor through November, December, and January and February, four months, a third of the year. And Stewart denied Missouri's right to secede. He said, no, Missouri is not going to secede from the Union. Now, Jackson wants to move neutral Missouri into the Southern Confederacy, and he slants all of his ideas and political uh, agendas to look to the South for its protection and security. And in St. Louis, then, an organization called the Minutemen, Minutemen come to be, in fact, organized. Jackson, when he's governor, he issues a call for a state convention, and uh, the delegates, unfortunately for Jackson, were overwhelmingly union, with about 80% of the delegates to the state convention having union sentiments. Sterling Price, this time, is kind of neutral again uh, for a while, and he is elected the convention president, and one month later, the convention votes 98 to 1 that, quote, no cause existed to impel Missouri to dissolve her connections with the Federal Union. So this is probably the ultimate political rebuke for Jackson. I mean, this, this really hits him strong. It, and then, of course, President Lincoln issues his call for troops. And Jackson replies uh, that the approximate 3,100 troops that uh, Missouri would furnish uh, will not be furnished uh, and writes back to the president and says, Sir, your requisition is illegal, unconstitutional, and revolutionary in its object, inhuman, and diabolical. So not one man will Missouri furnish to carry on such an unholy crusade against her southern sisters. So this is a letter that uh, goes back to Lincoln when the requisition comes to the Union of So now you have a pretty good idea of which way the, uh, the state of Missouri is going. You have uh, the Camp Jackson affair, which takes place in, uh, I think it's Tower Grove Park area now, uh, in St. Louis, uh, where the Minutemen are mustering for a drill, and uh, at that time a young firebrand, red-headed captain named Nathaniel Lyon and some federal troops uh, had been previously ordered into St. Louis from Fort Scott, Kansas. So they are on hand, and uh, the Minutemen are countered by a group of German immigrants who form and start drilling in the Turner Halls, uh, which is the same thing in the, in the predecessor of uh, the restaurant down Cape, the New Orleans, which was a Turnovan Hall, which was a it was kind of like a physical, kind of like health point, where you bulk up and things like that, where you exercise and hold big uh, events. Uh, so Lyon, with his pro-Union German, surround the camp, 
and capture the Minutemen and they're marching them back to downtown St. Louis to incarcerate them. And a shot is fired and uh, about 28 people, both uh, military and civilians are killed and approximately 75 are wounded. Two prominent people, which we hear about a lot later, witness uh, this march. General Grant, who become General Grant, and Sherman. Sherman and Grant are witnessing this march back. Sherman with his sons, I understand, and then he, uh, they both witness it. And at this time, because of this, Sterling Price now, who has been basically neutral, uh, aligns with uh, Jackson and the Democrats. And the State Guard command, he's appointed State Guard commander, which is equivalent to our Adjutant General now, the Missouri Army and Air National Guard in Jefferson City. So Price and at that time Brigadier General Harney, who is the Commandant of St. Louis uh, District, come to a conclusion and they actually agreed to a non-aggression pact. Federal and Union forces will not be used to enforce any insurrections in the state of Missouri, St. Louis, and Price says our Minutemen or our National Guard will take care of all those incursions so you won't have to incite anti-Southern feelings. We'll handle all of the legal matters. Now, you had extremists on both sides who opposed this agreement because, you know, you have the firebrands who are advocating uh, revolution, you have the Unionists who are advertising keeping, keeping Missouri in the uh, Union, and General Harney for some reason is reassigned because of the political influence of the Blair family in St. Louis who were strong Republicans and uh, a couple of them knew Lincoln personally, one of them was appointed postmaster under Lincoln. So Lyon now meets with uh, Jackson and Price and he and Blair talk at the old Planters Hotel in St. Louis for about six or seven hours to try to reach some kind of a reasonable accommodation. And after nothing happening, which is settling Lyon as a firebrand, and he actually tells Jackson, we are declaring war on Missouri. You have one hour to evacuate the city under my escort. So basically, he rich Jackson in Price from St. Louis and the state. At that time, Jackson gets over into Jeff City, issues a call for about 50,000 militia volunteers to protect Missourians, and he repositions to Boonville along the Missouri River, then down to Lamar in southwest Missouri, birthplace of Harry Truman. Then uh, on the 19th of July in 1861, 18, 19 July, 18, he escapes to Little Rock, Arkansas, being forced out or evicted from Missouri. Now he goes uh, to Richmond, Virginia, meets with Jefferson Davis to try to secure support for uh, the, the uh, Missouri forces, and Davis promises uh, support as soon as Missouri secedes. And the Southern Congress then can appropriate funds and support legally. Then he travels to Memphis, he issues the Proclamation of Independence, uh, Jackson does, and uh, says Missouri is now independent and sovereign, and of course this carries no legal uh, authority. And in August of 61, he's with General Price and General Ben McCulloch from Arkansas to witness uh, Lyon's defeat and death at the Battle of Wilson's Creek, or what the Confederates uh, called Oak Hills, uh, a little bit south of Springfield. Then he returns to Springfield as the Union forces retreat with Price in September. He keeps going north to Lexington, Missouri, and witnesses uh, Price's greatest uh, success in the Battle of the Hemp Bales, uh, which is kind of a famous uh, battle in the state of Missouri and has its own uh, interests. And during his absence from the state, the newspapers now, within the state, both the Democratic, the Whig, and, uh, get together and kind of repudiate his actions and blame him for the war situation in Missouri. So now his own press has turned against him because there's extreme guerrilla warfare going on throughout the state. In October 28th, he convenes the 21st General Assembly 
in the old shul, Missouri, down in southwest Missouri. And this is basically a rump legislature. He doesn't have a quorum of duly elected legislature, so what he does, he sends his people out into the, the city and area and stuff like that and uh, swears in legislators uh, who have proxies to vote for the duly elected legislators who wouldn't be there, and they pass an ordinance of secession which is based on his course guidance and instructions. It has no legal authority because the duly elected legislatures did not uh, vote personally. So now, the large population of Missouri's residents refused to reorganize, recognize and obey this ordinance of secession. Now, October the 28th, 1862, the Confederate Congress finally admitted Missouri as a full and equal member of the 12th Confederate state. So now you have two governments claiming to govern Missouri. You have the southern government under Price, and then you have the appointed Union Governor Gamble, uh, both go trying to claim Missouri. Gamble has the advantage. He's here. Jackson's not here. You know, he's wondering around. So, Jackson actually believed that he and Missouri were independent from Richmond. They didn't really want to, the ties of the Confederacy, except for when they needed money, when they needed men, and when they needed military supplies. So, early in December of 1862, Jackson is still on the road, which after the eviction of Missouri, he's on the road constantly. And he goes to New Orleans for the winter, and he comes briefly back to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, where he dies of stomach cancer on December the 7th, 1862. A stranger in a strange land, Arkansas, much like the Confederate state of Missouri itself. That's the end of the presentation. Do you have any questions? Say, yes? Um, when he was governor, did he do anything other than try to mow through the, the war issue and all? He didn't have all the power because the Union had uh, put thousands of troops in Missouri. So Jackson really had a disorganized militia. They were, they were the Missouri forces a lot of times which uh, one of the books that uh, Beth has there uh, in Deadly Earnest, they were all siphoned off east of the river to fight for the Confederacy. And the only folks you had back in Missouri were some National Guard containers and uh, Jeff Thompson's guerrillas down in uh, you know, the Boot Hill area and so forth, and the guerrilla actions. So he had no real military power. Couldn't do anything. And he's He's evicted from the state, basically. He can't come back into control. And Sterling Price is commanding the Missouri troops that are fighting with the Confederacy. Again, east of the river. So he's got no, he's got no leverage in Missouri at all. So, and for as the running of the government, it just was no. just nothing much done. He, he, was, he, was, he was running the government while he was running back and forth. <laughs> So, you know, and, and he couldn't do anything legally because Missouri uh, came under the Union control and uh, had its own appointed governor uh, to run the states legally or illegally, depending on which side you <laughs> It's a Missouri appointed governor. That's military again? No. Who did no. the appointing? I think his name was Gamble. Who appointed? The president. President, president Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah. Appointed well, the yeah. acting governor. Yeah, sure, sure. He, had, you know, he didn't have an election. When Jackson goes out of the state, uh, very quickly, Missouri came kind of under uh, martial law to a certain extent. And so they had to have some type of civilian authority as a figurehead, you know, so that they could do business with Missouri. But what, so then the only who enforced the law? The Union troops? The, the Union military. Okay. Military district of St. Louis. And then, of course, the Union forces fighting, uh, like Island Number 10 down uh, here in New Madrid, the big battle 
a lot of, and we uh, we had a lot of gorilla problems. And uh, there's another book that Beth has over there called Inside War by Michael Feldman, and talks about the gorilla warfare in the state of Missouri. And I was telling her before uh, we started, uh, I saw a Missouri Historical Review publication that talked about that the German community up in the west central part of the state, uh, primarily the Germans. And the guerrillas came up, but Buddy Bill Anderson being primarily the one, and just completely almost annihilated those citizens. Just, you know, he called about rape, pillage, and burn. That was, it was terrible. And of course, the, the Germans, all they wanted, the heritage, all they wanted to do was be left alone so they could farm and do their thing. But uh, these folks came up and, you know, were getting all their crops to support themselves, basically. It was not a good time in the state of Missouri during the 1860s. Yeah, but so was the legislature functioning then? You had a uh, governor basically appointed by the union that ruled by edict primarily. So it was more or less martial law. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, you had the muscles to support it and all you were doing were fighting guerrillas and, and the partisans, which is not a good, it's not an equal contest. You know, it's like trying to Good, good handful of jello. You know. No, there, there was no uh, defined legislature during that time. So the law and order pretty well broke down, except for there were bodies of organized. Well, there were strong bodies of union forces, Tom. And the guerrillas themselves, some of them were one side or the other, but a lot of them were just outlaws, right? True. You know, they were True. just. Yeah, a lot of, uh, some of them were Southern deserters or uh, Missourians who had formally enlisted and got tired of that silly business. Uh, you know, when, when you don't have any equipment, uh, you're without weapons, you're, you're walking barefooted and stuff like that uh, through rain, snow, hail, and ice. And uh, you're living off of uh, green corn and acorns and stuff like that. Not a good time. Not a good time for the Missouri. And it's not. So I think the Confederacy, what did they have to really legally support? You know, they were doing all their business uh, in the Eastern Theater. Or we'd say East the Mountains. Sad time for Missouri. Sad time for Missouri, unfortunately. But we've survived, in spite of ourselves, maybe. Thanks for being here, guys. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, uh, Third Sunday of every month, 2 p.m., Hannibal Lutheran Church. We have very, very interesting programs, and uh, you're invited to be a guest anytime. There's no obligation to, to join our organization. We're uh, really an expensive organization. We, our dues is $20 a, a year. Um, do you have a website, or is there a way to find out what the topics will be? Uh, there's a newsletter which the membership receives, and in the uh, Saturday, uh, Friday, Missouri, and there's a little uh, blip, and then in the Sundays, uh, Missouri, in the features area of, of the events or something like that, usually there's a, a little more uh, broad encapsulation of what the program is concerned. I'm interested in it, my husband especially. Good, good. Come join us. Come join us.